and everyone welcome to the Wednesday we have webinar series um, we are joined today with Charlie Bloom uh, from DadCap and I will allow him to introduce himself but really quick I just wanted to do the reminder that please turn off your microphone so that we don't get any background noise um, and we We'll be having our webinar series next month as well. And then it starts to kind of skip around a little bit. So we'll have it in July and August. And then we skip September since that's our conference month. Um, so stay tuned for our announcements on those. And um, if you've missed any of the webinars, you can always catch those later by going to the WeHa website, so WeHa.net, and um, check them out there. So without further ado, Charlie Bloom. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and start my presentation. Um, hopefully, you all can see that. So like Deanna said, thank you very much for having me. My name is Charlie Bloom. I am a licensing specialist with the state of Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. Um, I come from the agent side. I was a retail and rec sanitarian with Waukesha County for about almost four years. Um, I, at that point, I moved to DadCap where I was a manufactured sanitarian, manufactured food sanitarian in the, the city of Milwaukee, where I did food processing plant and warehouse inspections for about a uh, little, about three years. Uh, I did help out a little bit with the retail and rec on the state side as well in the uh, Walworth County area. And then uh, I recently got this role oh, about nine months ago. So um, just a little bit about me, just a little background. So farmer's market licensing, uh, I like to start with our mission, uh, the DATCAP mission, which is ensuring safe food, lodging, and recreation by educating, regulating businesses in a fair, effective, and efficient manner. I like to always highlight the uh, fair, effective, and efficient manner. I think we strive to send out consistent information to folks and to really make sure that we're providing fair rulings, interpretations that we're you know, discussing and, and talking about and, and having those uh, discussion so that we can assure that everybody is being regulated the same. A little bit into the Wisconsin statutes that impact the food program. Uh, the first one I like to highlight is chapter 97. That's our food lodging and recreation. This is establishing the authority to license and inspect. And there you can see the different areas, the dairy, warehouses, direct sale of eggs, uh, food processing plants, and the retail food. As we get into the specifics, we can talk about the administrative chapters of the administrative rules. So uh, meat and meat food products. Uh, we in the, the department of two bureaus, the meat side and then uh, the, you know, the, the Bureau of Food and Recreational Safety. Um, typically with meat and meat products, I am, if it's wholesaling, I am sending them over to our meat folks to have that discussion. 65 is, is dairy, that milk and milk products. 70 is the food processing plants. So those are those places that are doing primarily wholesaling of those of those non-meat products. We have food warehouses uh, and the one we're going to concentrate on today is 75 which is retail food establishments and then of course 75 appendix which is the Wisconsin food code. We then have 87 which is honey and maple syrup and 88 eggs. So the first thing I'd like to jump into is the retail exempt at a farmer's market. When you go to a farmer's market, you see all sorts of things. Um, one of the first things I like to touch on is the retail exempt because we're looking at two criteria with that. And this is something that I will send out to, to folks that inquire about this. It's 75.063, uh, I can't remember the last number, but everything is prepackaged from an approved source. Uh, we have no processing that's occurring. And then nothing is potentially hazardous, meaning that you don't need refrigeration or you know kept frozen for food safety. Here we're seeing some you know, examples of what that could look like at a farmer's market. And the definition, we're, we're talking about that 75.063. And so you know, this covering the sale of those, those chips, candy bars, cans of pop, um, that, that's what we're looking for. Another thing to check when you're doing these is, is you know, possibly looking at the label, seeing a declaration of responsibility and some of those basic label requirements. 
next thing that you're bound to see at a farmer's market is raw agricultural produce. No license is required to retail or wholesale raw harvest cut produce. So that's one of the first things I will ask folks that contact us is, uh, are you going past the harvest cut? If you are, you know, then you're adding your value adding and that is a processing activity. But you can rinse them with fresh water and you can package for convenience. So like, like clamshell bags, something along those lines. Those are some of the guidances that we send, uh, send individuals. Another popular thing you're gonna see is the home canning exemption. This is laid out in that state statute, that 97 that I quoted or looked at before. Um, the next slide goes into a little bit more, I like this slide a lot because it kind of breaks down the types of products that you can have, those pickled fruits or vegetables, if you're looking for an equilibrium pH of 4.6 or less. Sauerkraut, salsas, chutneys, jams and jellies, applesauce. The sales requirements are very, very important and with this, uh, with this as well, we're talking about the community or social events, um, specifically those farmers markets in this discussion, and no more than $5,000 in sales per year. And then something I think I remember having as like a cheat sheet was looking at the labeling, which we're talking about those labels that have to say it was made in a private home, um, name and address of who did the canning, and then the ingredients in descending order of prominence, including the common name for any uh, you, you can see there the allergens listed out. Pickle bill, um, what is not allowed? So products not permitted, we're looking at fish, meat, eggs, um, really common ones that we get are like dressings or condiments. That's something that uh, folks will reach out to us about as well that we talk about. The bakery items, um, packaged foods or other processed food, low acid vegetables. Uh, sales not permitted are wholesaling, so that's the resale by somebody else, and wholesaling is where you are going to be relinquishing control of that food product, right? You're distributing it or giving it to or selling it to a distributor rather, or, you know, selling it to a grocery store to sell for you or whatever the case is. Um, event via the internet or out of state, and uh, we're just, that's what we're looking for, is, and, and no out of, uh, out of your home as well. Okay, sorry about that. So where is it being sold? If at a producer's home, they would need to process the product with a food processing license and they sell at the farm stand retail exempt. At the farmer's market, they could sell the product under the pickle bill or from a licensed food processing plant. Either way, the stand at the farmer's market would be retail exempt because it's meeting those uh, two criteria we touched on earlier in the presentation. Eggs. Eggs are something uh, with Act 245. If you look on our data cap site, that's a really uh, great place to get information, but we're looking for the exemption for food processing plants for sales at farm, egg sales route and farmer's market. Um, and an egg producer has to meet the following requirements. Um, it can't be, the egg producer's flock does not exceed 150 and the egg producer sells the eggs directly to a consumer through one of the venues. Again, we're talking about the premise where the eggs were laid at the farmer's market located in the state or on an egg sales route. Um, you need a food processing license to wholesale eggs. That is something that if somebody is looking to do that, you can send them our way. That's gonna be a, a common theme of this presentation as well, is that you can send uh, folks our way for that, for that wholesale license and we can send them that information. Um, but that does not exempt them from a retail license at farmer's market, so they need that, that transient license. Um, packaged eggs uh, need to be in a carton that's labeled the producer's name and address, the date the eggs were packed in the carton, a sell-by date within 30 days, and a statement indicating that the eggs in the package are ungraded and uninspected, and they must be kept in an ambient temperature no higher than 41 degrees at all times. If they're using an egg container with information on it, they can redact that, black that out, and uh, use that. Here on the next two slides, we're talking about poultry and then livestock, so cattle, swine, and sheep. Uh, I like to think of these as levels, and you can see on the slide what you need to do for producer's premise versus farmer's market, and then selling to a retail establishment, and kind of, I like to think of it as like a, it, 
kind of levels up in a, in a sense where it produces premise, you do without inspection or license, can slaughter and sell the birds, um, has to be direct to consumer and it has to be labeled, not inspected. When you get to that farmer's market, you need that transient food license and it needs to be slaughtered and processed at that licensed meat facility. Again, labeled, not inspected and name, address and net weight. And then for a retail establishment, um, that is one where they need to be processed at a licensed meat establishment. And we can, um, that is something that information that we can send out or give them to our meat side. Livestock, again, talking about these three different levels, that's the way I look at them, that's the way I think about them. Uh, and again, we're looking at, I'm sure a lot of you've done those um, inspections, the retail food license inspections for the producer's premise, where they have that freezer that they're keeping it cold. Farmer's market or mobile, you need that transient food license um, in the storage that the farm must hold a retail or a warehouse license. And then the wholesale from farm, um, again, is uh, going over to that, that meat side. So the producer's premise is almost like a small grocery store on their premise. Apple cider sales, these are all, these are license exempt. Um, if you're meeting the criteria on the slides for producing at a farm and direct to consumers at community events. Warning statement if packaged and not pasteurized, they cannot wholesale and you can't produce other products that require a license. So you're looking at that part of it. Um, if they're gonna be doing other activities, though, that would fall underneath their, their activities and they would need to be processing underneath that license. Maple syrup, uh, I'm gonna go to the next slide. This is just the 97 statute uh, reference, but this slide kind of lays it out a little bit better where they're talking about the license exempt, where no license from a production farm or farmer's market and no license to sell the food produce processor up to 5,000. You need that food processing plant license once you are, you're doing that wholesaling, you're adding other ingredients, you're mixing in other, people syrup and you're exceeding the $5,000 threshold to other processors. Um, if you are going to be selling that, the labels need to conform to minimum requirements, such as the common name of the food, name and location of the processor, distributor, and the net quantity. And they have to be labeled according to standards found in ATCP 87 or labeled ungraded. Honey, uh, no license for wholesale or retail. Uh, you do need to have a food processor license if the processor is packaging bee products from a source other than that, other than that produced from his or her own apiary or if air flavorings are added. Here, I like this. So this slide a lot because you're talking about, did you buy the honey from other apiaries? Did you add flavorings? If you're no, if those are no, no license needed. Um, you can sell from home, farmer's market, retail, wholesale, and as an ingredient to food processors. However, if we're looking at yes or yes, um, then we're looking at that license. So the retail license, if 25% is, you know, if less than 25% are wholesale, processing if 25% or more are wholesale. Retail nonprofit exemptions. So these are the, those sales. And again, and you can see in the ATCP 75.063, that is a uh, part of the code I look at a lot with the exemptions, but you're looking at the not serving meals operated occasionally by a religious charitable or nonprofit organization defined in that 26 use SC 501C. Um, no license of sales or 12 or fewer in a 12 or fewer days in a licensing year. We're talking about candies, pies, um, things of that nature. We will send them, you know, or recommend that they follow transient event sand fact sheets to protect the public. The department has the authority to put food on hold that's been adulterated or misbranded in this capacity. Here we have the, the retail meals, the restaurant foods. So no license if it's three or less days in a calendar year. Again, and we're gonna recommend that you follow that transient um, event stand fact sheet uh, to protect the public. And then we also see that code citation talking about the operated by a church, religious, fraternal youth or patriotic organization, service club or civic organization and occasionally is defined in uh, 75, I believe. It's 75 or 97, but I think it's 75, if memory serves me correctly. So what is a license? Two parts to every license, operator licensee and the facility. Uh, licenses are not transferable. If one of the two things change, a new license is required. 
Um, we talk to folks a lot about reapplying for a license. Um, a really common situation is that they're in a shared kitchen or a production kitchen and they change kitchens or it's not working out at their kitchen and they move locations. Maybe their LLC or their corporation or sole proprietorship, whatever it is, is staying the same. They need to reapply for a license at that new physical location. Types of retail food establishments. I don't think I, I can go into this detail if we have more questions at the end, but I think we'll go right to uh, the mobile. So mobile retails, uh, we have the same breakdown of serving meals, hot dog, push cart, sandwich truck, barbecue food truck, uh, mobile retail. So we're looking at those, um, the not serving meals, we're looking at that divide again. And the difference here is you can vend on public or private property. Um, you know, not during that special event uh, stipulation with a transient license. Both are evaluated using the same Wisconsin food code and that is chapter nine. Here we have the transient. So the transient is that special event. We're talking about serving meals and not serving meals. Um, and that's the 50% or more depending on what they are doing. Uh, a special event means a department recognized event that is sponsored, planned, organized, and publicly advertised by organizations that include the following, neighborhood associations, religious groups, cultural groups, political parties, churches, schools, sports teams, fraternal organizations, nonprofit organizations, and city, county, state, or federal governments. Sorry about that. So transient Retail, those are the three levels. I like to think of them as levels. It's kind of just how my head works, um, but I'm thinking processing potentially hazardous, um, processing with the non-potentially hazardous. You can see some of the pictures up on there of things you might see at a farmer's market and then no processing. Um, a trailer can be a transient if they are satisfying those requirements that we just discussed in that special event. And here is that, uh, that what I just read um, and going on to the next one, Special events are limited gatherings of people. You know, again, we're talking about those farmers markets and then any other event approved by a regulatory agency. But a potluck is not a special event. So this is in specific for transients. And we're talking about how they cannot operate as a street vendor and they can't operate in parking lots, street corners, or private property. Um, the mobile retail is included in both categories. The, the, that spectrum of the mobile retail facilities is, is rather large. Um, that mobile food establishment means a restaurant or retail food establishment where food is served or sold from movable vehicle, push cart, trailer, or boat, which periodically or continuously changes location. It requires a service space to accommodate the unit for servicing, cleaning, inspection, and maintenance, um, or except as specified in, in uh, a section of the food code. Again, the, the transient license types, um, and here we are with the, the, food, the final food products. So if it requires refrigeration, then the, the potentially hazardous license. Um, if it doesn't require refrigeration, then the non-potentially hazardous. You see a couple of examples up on the screen. Here we have the transient retail, that prepackaged one, where everything is prepackaged, but they operate at special events. No processing, so no sinks are required. Um, typically, you're going to see that frozen meat, eggs, and other TCS foods made off-site at a licensed location and brought in uh, prepackaged for retail sales. Here's the temporary food service guidelines that we send out. Um, I send this out quite frequently. Um, if, you, if you'd like that, we, I can send that out to, to anybody here in this meeting, just reach out. I think that's, a, that's really the common theme of this is to reach out um, myself, Mark, uh, Dan, we all are here to help out and to send that information out. Um, the licensing process. So for one of the first things that we talk about are transient retail, the location that determines that licensing agency. Um, the transient license is honored throughout the state. Uh, your local health departments may charge an inspection fee. Uh, typically, will the licensing specialist will provide an application information on facility requirements in addition to the required training, um, certifications, we're gonna get that completed application. We're gonna send that to our support. And then our inspectors receive the application and schedule the licensing inspection. And then the facility is officially licensed or issued a conditional license if that is necessary. Really just, um, this is 
when we were doing some fair meetings, this is a little bit more, but uh, I think this is still applicable of, you know, contact us early if you have questions, um, understand and stay updated on the rules and regulations and, and really just ask questions that's what we're here for um, is to help out as much as possible and to be, you know, education over, over you know, that having to take action, but we're, we, you know, looking for education first. Here is our contact information uh, if you have general inquiries. So I'm sure that the voicemail line, um, I, I think my number was sent out, which is, you know, please contact me, please reach out. You can call me directly. I'm totally fine with that. That is, you know, 100% part of my job and I'm, I'm here to help out. Um, and then our email address that we monitor um, throughout the week. So that's what I have. Well, thank you, Charlie. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to open it up to any conversation. If anyone has any questions, feel free to either put it in the chat box or unmute yourself if you're brave enough and ask your question. Hey, Charlie, it's Jennifer from City, or I'm sorry, Racine County. Can you just touch yeah. base on the whole lovely Baker cottage yeah. bill court proceedings that is going on and what is the timeline and so on and so forth? So I, I just to be frank, I don't have a timeline, um, you know, nothing along those lines. I'll, uh, hold on, I wanna share. Hopefully you guys, can you all see this maybe my screen again? Yes, hopefully. Okay, so this is what I'm defaulting to because uh, really it's it's on May 31st, the, you know, those kinds of court of appeals put in the, the December 28th ruling on a hold pending final resolution. And that's the most updated information I have at this time. We are back to, you know, not back to, but we are at the court orders only applying to baked goods. Um, I really like to highlight, the, oops, sorry, this section, the baked goods. Um, so the generally exposed to dry heat transferred via air at a temperature above 140 to a food in a closed chamber, such as an oven. Um, so that's really what I like to concentrate on is that definition and then the not potentially hazardous and direct sales to consumers. But that is what we have right now. Our website is, up to date. Um, I know right on that May 30th or May 31st, they updated this to to take down what was the non potentially hazardous with you know the that that uh, ruling or whatever it was that was in place for what was that uh, five months? Yeah. So that's that's the most up to date we have right now is is that website and concentrating on that. Um, I do have uh, you know one of the things that we looked at was something from Dr. Ingham that I checked in with Brian, who is now um, the internal operations section manager. Um, granola bars. Oh, sorry, I just saw that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's a good segue into that. It doesn't have to be a requirement that it's flour or meal based. So this is something that we had from Dr. Ingham um, back a little bit ago and Mark and myself, Mark, Dan, and myself, we reached out to Brian and asked for a little bit of guidance on this. And, um, you know, he, he agreed that that could still be it, but so we're not doing, it doesn't have to be, there's no longer requirement that the items have to be flour meal based on um, the final product has to be non-potentially hazardous. Um, so that could be, the food could be non-potentially hazardous, non hazardous before baking or result of baking. We are interpreting baking broadly. So it's an application of dry heat transfer via air to temperature above 140 in a closed chamber, such as an oven. Um, and then, yeah, that's what we have. So I, you know, granola bars, I just talked to uh, Troy yesterday and uh, yeah, granola, something along those lines that would be a baked good because you're meeting those, those requirements or you're, that you're meeting that uh, definition. Discuss more about soldering poultry on the farm and selling direct. Uh, yeah, I, I, Jennifer, can you maybe, I don't know if there's more to that in terms of like soldering poultry on the farm. I mean, it's just a, 
you know, without with that, you just don't need that that license to do that direct without a license as long as direct to consumer. I can send um, one of our flyers. We have some. I don't know if you guys. I don't know if anybody has the direct uh, poultry sales flyer. I can send that out. That's something that um, if you reach out to me or our shared mailbox, I can send out that flyer. But that's a good brochure that I reference a lot. I have a question. Is is that document available on uh, the website already on the DadCap website? I'm not sure. We just have it in our licensing uh, email, so it might be. I just I'm not sh sure off the top of my head. My apologies. Let me see if I can. So Charlie Jennifer again with Racine. Um, yeah. Can you briefly go over when an establishment would require a warehouse license and when they do not? I've gotten mixed answers and from various vendors on they were told they don't need it versus when they do. Okay. Uh, I mean, if they're whole, if they are holding, storing something or a, a food or a food product over 24 hours that's what we're looking at was there like a specific situation where they were told they didn't need it does it matter if it's tcs or non-tcs no no i've done yeah i've done inspections at warehouses of you know for example like uh, alcohol products um, that's something that i've done inspections of at a warehouse and is there a limit to the amount that they do um, can you uh, elaborate or, or sorry, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the question. I'm drawing a blank at the <laughs> moment of any example, but like if they only have one shelving unit full of material versus a whole garage. I've inspected warehouses as small as a little closet to, you know, huge over 50,000 square foot warehouses. So it's a pretty broad uh, ruling. Okay. So people are basically lying to me, but that's not a shocker. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, you can you can send them to us and we can make that determination because that would, you know, warehouse license would fall under the state. So we can, you know, talk to folks if you want to send them our way for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Dehydrator. Okay, let me look at... I believe so Charlie I think on your the last one that you had pulled up it specifically addressed the dehydrating yeah it did that's what I was trying to remember without uh yeah I think in that last sentence it uh it talked about it yeah items dried in a dehydrator are not considered baked goods Jessica, can you send that one in? Just because I want to make sure that I can look that one up off the top of my head. I'm not sure. Um, so if, if you want to send that one in, that would be fantastic. And I can do a little bit of research on that. Can we get the answer to that question to the group then? Because to my understanding, then that would be an unapproved source with an, on a retail license. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Sorry. I had this come up also with eggs. This is Jessica Jungenberg. Um, the farm sells their farm raised beef. They take it to slaughter, get it done and packaged, labeled properly. Um, they hold it in freezers to sell on their little farm. Um, but they also have eggs that 
they have a flock of 150 or less, but I was told they couldn't sell the eggs in the same building as where they hold that retail license because it was an unapproved source. So that's why I was wondering, is the chicken the same way where it's, you know, they can slaughter them and sell them to people, but they can't be housed in the same retail building on the farm? Yeah, that's a great question. I, yeah, I'll have to, I, I mean, I'll, I just don't want to give an answer and be, you know, incorrect or, or not feel 100% about it. So if, if we can, yeah, again, send that in, that would be fantastic. Just because I don't know if it would be like a mixing approved and unapproved situation uh, or what the case is, but I'd rather get a, a for sure answer and, and do a little research than, you know, say something right now that could be incorrect. So yeah, yeah and I apologize. I just like to do my due diligence. Charlie, if you wouldn't mind following up on that, then you can just send the response to me and I'll okay. make sure that I send it out to all of the, uh, the we have membership listing. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Do we have any more questions? I know we're at about 9.03. Uh, Charlie did say that this is typically a PowerPoint that takes a little bit longer um, to go through more in detail. So if you do have any questions um, that you maybe just didn't quite catch what he said, you can always feel free to reach out to him. Also, this will be on our uh, YouTube channel. So if it's a great way to go back and reference it and if you didn't catch something. So, uh, but I will leave it open for just a, a few more seconds here to see if we have any more questions. Charlie, this is Amber from Florence. I do have a quick question on the eggs. So farm fresh eggs, what all is needed on for labeling? Uh, they are going to need me. They are going to need the package in a carton that is labeled the producer's name and address, the date the eggs were packed into the carton, a sell-by date within 30 days, and a statement indicating the eggs in the package were ungraded and un uninspected. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can, with the wholesaling, if, if they're wholesaling eggs, you can send them our way as well. We'll, we'll, get, them, we'll get them the information. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Well, with that label, do they have to have that on the, if they're not wholesaling, they just direct to consumer? That same yeah, label? Gonna, yeah. Okay. yeah, looking for that package carton. Yep, yep, yep. okay, thanks. All right, well, I think we will be wrapping up here. It looks like our questions have slowed down. So again, thank you, Charlie, for joining us. Um, and you guys can always feel free to reach out to DadCap Licensing for any questions just to get uh, more clarification on anything that you have heard today. Otherwise, this will be posted on our YouTube channel. So we had, or yes, we had.net is where you can find that. And we have all of our webinars on there. So if you've missed any, go check them out. Thanks again, guys, for joining. Have a great rest of your day.